What is up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods here, back here with another interview. And this is one that I have the honor to have North Dakota State Director of Athletics, Matt Larson, with me today. This is a guy who has increased the athletic budget by millions of dollars from about $18 million to over $24.5 million at North Dakota State. Was the FCS Athletics Director of the Year in 2018-2019 and has just, compl- has just been a major, major part in a new athletic complex being built, financed for over $50 million at North Dakota State. This guy has done it all, multi-ties, been the athletic director for multiple national championships. Matt, I appreciate you giving me some time out of your very, very busy schedule. Well, no, thanks so much for for having me on. And as we talked about before we went live, just appreciate your coverage of FCS football. And uh, it's a great brand of football, great level of football. And so the more coverage we can get out there, the better. Absolutely. And I started the show by talking about how you've increased the athletic budget. I believe here on the North Dakota State website, it says about $18 million to over almost $25 million under your direction. For people who are not in the, I would say, administration aspect of athletics, how has that been done? What have been the keys for you and the people surrounding you to increasing that athletic budget at North Dakota State? Well, I think most folks in college athletics understand now to, to be able to grow your budget, a lot of that's not going to come from the institution. And so you really have to look at, you know, what external revenue streams either you currently have and how do you grow them or what other new uh, revenue streams are out there and, and what are some opportunities. And so that's where we really focused on a lot. And, you know, a lot of our bigger external revenue streams are ticket sales are obviously really big here at NDSU. We're fortunate to have a great fan base. Uh, that supports us really well, and not just for football, but across all of our sports. Uh, we also have some some seat dues that go along with what our season tickets for for both football and men's basketball, and and those are big drivers. Um, and one of the revenue streams there was we actually added seat dues. We did about a fifty million dollar renovation to our indoor uh, athletic complex as well, uh, and moved in here in two thousand sixteen. That included a a a, a revamped and renovated. Uh, uh, basketball facility and so did reseeding in there and added seat dues so that was one revenue stream a lot of ours certainly come from philanthropy you know we we're fortunate that we have an incredible fan base uh, a lot of fcs fans have seen it down in frisco they travel really well they're incredibly passionate they care a bunch but they also support support us financially whether it's capital projects uh, whether it's annual giving or through our team makers organization. And so a lot of our expansion of our revenue has been through philanthropy, but also multimedia. We outsource to Learfield. So we have Bison Sports properties here on campus. And so trying to just to maximize some of our relationships and partnerships uh, within our community to really drive revenue, whether that's through our radio and TV contracts that we have here locally with uh, ABC North Dakota and also Radio FM Media, uh, but also just um, – being able to co-brand with a lot of our, our great corporate partners here in town. And that's what we've seen between those couple of areas have really been able to move the needle and grow our athletic budget to then be able to turn around and reinvest that back in our programs. And, and you mentioned the the media contracts. A lot of people, uh, that's been a big talk around the FCS is how can we, because we see the Big Ten just before we started this interview just mm-hmm. signed, I believe, a $7 billion yeah. media contract. The The TV market in Fargo isn't, you know, one that is like a LA or anything like that. What are the biggest challenges in negotiating TV radio contracts in a in an area like Fargo where you're not going to have the millions, millions of people that you have in some of these larger TV markets? Well, it's interesting. I mean, and again, this goes back to us being incredibly fortunate. You know, we're the kind of the professional team in the state of North Dakota. The the nearest pro team is about three and a half hours away in Minneapolis. And so one of the things, and this goes back, this predates when I arrived here, was statewide TV coverage for, for football has been critical. Uh, and, it, and it's aligned with probably the most successful period in our history with winning nine national championships over the last decade or so. And so that's really helped. And so for every household in the state of North Dakota for young people across the state, for our fans, our alums to be able to wake up, be able to turn on the TV and watch and watch Bison football has been critical for us. And so even though we have less than a million people in the state, you know, our share of, of people, our ratings of people watching it are, are very similar to NFL games on Sunday. And again, I think that speaks a lot to just the power of our fan base. So, so that's critical for us because as, as much as we love to pack the dome, the dome seats, you know, around 19,000 or so, there's a lot of Bison fans that aren't in the Dome on Saturday. So the opportunities for them to be able to watch 
Bison Football Live is, is really important to us. Uh, and then from a radio network, we're fortunate. We have about we have our flagship in Radio FM Media, Bison 1660. We have a branded uh, uh, radio station. We do programming on there in addition to covering games. Uh, but we also have 26 radio affiliates that, that stretch across uh, North Dakota into South Dakota, Western Minnesota. Uh, and that's really important for us in a, in a rural state. Uh, so many of our folks consume bison football or bison basketball or bison athletics through the radio. And so having uh, not only an, an app that you can access through the Internet or through your phone, but having those 26 affiliates that span our region and really cover uh, our fan base has been really important for us. I mean, we're a huge agricultural, agricultural community and, you know, harvest falls right smack dab in the middle of football. So for some of our great fans or alums who may be on the farm, you know, in the combine harvesting can still listen to Bison football and tune in. So that's been a huge piece of, again, not just our brand, but, but getting our, our product out to our fan base. Yeah. The guys at Bison 1660 are great. I was on, I was on one of the shows not too long ago and they do a great job up there, but your first big, I would say moment in your, in your career as the athletic director at North Dakota state was the coaching transition from coach Chris Kleiman, who took the job at Kansas state while it funnily, while funny, I was a Kansas state student at the time. That was a big deal down there in Manhattan and hiring head coach, Matt Entz and, one of the unique things about North Dakota State is three different have head coaches have won national titles for you guys in the past. What was that transition like for you, and how how easy was it for you to know that Matt Entz was the guy to take over for Chris Kleiman as the head coach of the football team? Yeah, well, it was definitely an interesting situation probably for a couple of reasons. One is uh, it was during our, our national championship run. So, you know, Chris had, and Chris and I, I have a ton of respect for Chris. We have a great relationship and, and so happy to see his success at, down at K-State. Uh, but he announced, it, it, it basically was announced on a Monday of our national semifinal game. And so, you know, at one point you're trying to prepare to, to win a national semifinal with a chance to go to the national championship. Uh, but also reassure your players that, you know, their, their best interest is we have their best interests at heart. We want to make a great hire for the football program. But then also that following Wednesday was signing day. So there were a lot of moving parts. So one, wanting to make sure we hired the right person, make sure that we were prepared to compete on Friday night in the semifinal game, but also make sure that we were maintaining our, maintaining our recruiting class and um, having uh, conversations with recruits and maintaining their commitment. So there were a lot of moving parts. And so, um, so one, I think we had to move relatively quickly. Uh, and I give our university administration a ton of credit for allowing us to move uh, really fast through that process. But, and I've said this before, I think when I, when I look at our program, um, and I'm sure a lot of folks say this, but I, I think our program is different than a lot of others in terms of the level of expectation. And so I, I'm a firm believer in, I think, to coach at NDSU, that having some previous affiliation with the program, it's not, it's not absolute, but I think it's important. You know, whether you've been a former player, whether you've been an, a GA, an intern, an assistant coach, whatever it might be, so you have an understanding of expectations, our fan base, the standard, um, bison pride, all of those things are really important to to who we are. And you know, fortunately, I'm I get a chance to to work really closely with our football program. I'm out at practices all the time. I get to see our coaches in their element. And so I got to watch Coach Enns for five years uh, and did an incredible job as our defensive coordinator under Coach Kleiman. You know, I had the chance to win four national championships. And so from an X's and O's, got to see just how talented he was, but also you get to see uh, how he interacts with our players, how he interacts with, his, with our community, uh, his understanding of Bison football and what we're about. Um, because we do it a certain way here. You can't have somebody come in who's going to, you know, install some sort of run and shoot or spread them out five wides. And that, that doesn't work here at NDSU. That's not who we are. That's not our identity. You know, we play great defense. We run the ball. We establish the line of scrimmage. And so having somebody who understands that was really important. And so um, not to say it's ever easy, but, you know, having seen Matt over five years and then being able to sit with him and talk about why, um, he should be the next head coach here at NDSU. Once you have that conversation, I felt really good. Again, given all those challenges we had that we talked about earlier of just the timing, uh, it ended up being an easy decision and, and it's played out really well. Coach, coach Entz and I have a great relationship. Uh, he've, he's had unbelievable success, really helped us manage through COVID, which was hard on everybody, um, but has two national championships to to speak for in his resume. And so uh, really excited to, you know, the future of our program under his leadership. 
I think it speaks volumes too that a lot of that staff stuck around and finished out that national championship run as well before you know heading to Manhattan. But out of conference games have been a huge topic of conversation across the FCS. You guys have some great ones lined up. I know the Eastern Washington one is one that a lot of people are looking forward to, but Power Five games in particular, you guys are six and zero in the last six that you've played, including a top twenty five win over over Iowa. For or uh, so for you. What has been the biggest struggle? Like when you get these power five teams on the phone, what what is sometimes the response that you get? And why why is it so hard for you guys right now to get those power five games scheduled? Well, I think it's a combination of things. And one, it's it's, you know, I think we're a, a victim of our own success a little bit. So not not only are um had we played those games recently, but we've won those games. And I and I think that's probably the thing that's hurt us the most. I look at at teams just within our league and who play a really good brand of football, who are who are who are physical in those things and you know, our, our local media says, well, how are they getting those games and we're not? And I think the difference is, is that not only we, when we've gotten those games, but that's, we've won them. And so I think that's, um, and I get it in a lot of, in a lot of ways, if you're a FBS program and you're, you're, you're going to schedule an FCS, you know, I want to schedule an FCS program that, that I know I'm going to win. And I don't know if, and again, a lot of respect for NDSU. And if I'm in their shoes, I don't know if I would schedule NDSU either. So I, I certainly get that, but um, FBS games are important to us. You know, it's important to our fan base. Our players enjoy the opportunity to play an FBS game. Well, we have one this year. We play at the University of Arizona in week three. That's our first FBS game in six years. We did have one scheduled during that COVID year that against Oregon that got canceled. Um, but there's a lot of excitement from our fan base. I think we'll have upwards of 10,000 fans down in, in Tucson for the Arizona game. So it's something they look forward to. It's a different opponent. It's a chance to, you know, see how we stack up against you know, a, an FBS program. And so we'll always continue to try to do that, but it's been hard. It's been hard to get those on the schedule. We have Colorado in 24 and we have that Oregon game rescheduled in 28. But outside of that, we don't have uh, any of their FBS games on the schedule. And have, have there been talks um, over the, uh, to try to get some games over, the, over those, that, that span in between Colorado and Oregon and how many schools right now have you guys just not uh, either haven't answered the phone or said no to? We've we've reached out to just about every FBS program, particularly at the Power Five level. I mean, that's that's the the kind of the level that I think we want to try to get a game against, and uh, and just haven't had a lot of success. And you know, I, there's probably a myriad of reasons why, but um, we keep seeing everybody else sign them, but we we've just struggled <laughs> to do that. And so, but again, we're we're going to keep trying, and we're going to keep reaching out, and hopefully, we get an opportunity to get some more of those on the schedule in the future. I'm excited. And one of the big news, I guess, news cycles this all season was the Tennessee State, North Dakota State home and home series. That's still that, that you guys were negotiating with Eddie George and them down at Tennessee State. How did that come together? And what 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 was it about Tennessee State's program that really stuck out to you guys and and for, for you guys to reach out and try to get this home and home signed? Well, I think there's a couple pieces. One, a lot of it, you know, as you try to build a schedule and it's happening so far out now. You know, where you're trying to compete, complete your schedule. So a lot of it has, has goes by who's available and who's not. And so that's certainly a piece of it. The other thing that we've tried to do, you mentioned our game against Eastern Washington. That's at U.S. Bank Stadium where the Minnesota Vikings play down in Minneapolis. We've tried to do some destination type things in lieu of having an FBS game. What are some things that will excite the fan base that will um, you know, give them an opportunity to go someplace different? Uh, and certainly the opportunity to, to potentially go down to Nashville. That's a that's a up and coming really popular destination for a lot of people. And so the ability to play down there, I know Tennessee State also plays uh, where the Tennessee Titans play. And so great experience for our student athletes, for our fan base. And then uh, just been really impressed with with Coach George and, and what he's been able to do in his short period of time there. And um, so excited for the opportunity to play against a, a really talented football team and you know, not only down there, but the opportunity for them to travel up here to the Fargo Dome as well. Yeah, and that staff, since they've come in, has, has not really been, I would say, avoiding any big games. They travel to Eastern Washington to go up there and play on the red turf, which I know you guys have done. So that's a big out-of-conference game, and they have some other ones in the works. But are there any other FCS teams out there that you guys have been in contact with to potentially schedule a home-at-home? Home, or has that also been difficult for you guys on top of also trying to find Power 5 opponents for, for the schedule? You know, I think scheduling is always a challenge, you know, and every school probably has a different philosophy on how they schedule. And, and there is a rhyme or a reason to how we build our schedule with, you know, in an 11 game season. Again, as I said, we'd always love to have an FBS game if we can. 
uh, having six home games for us is critical. And from a revenue standpoint, from a fan engagement standpoint, from a community uh, standpoint, those are really important for us. So there's four conference games and that leads you to non-conference games. And so uh, we've we've had FCS guarantee games here. Where we'll, we'll pay teams to come in here. And so but that's a challenge trying to find folks that, you know, everybody wants to get home games, too. And so, yeah. it, you know, in a non 12 game season, it's hard to, for us to do home and homes uh, again, keeping with the philosophy of trying to to get an FBS game as well. And, you know, we try to build our schedule uh, where in a year where we're, we're not fortunate enough to win the Missouri Valley Conference, we want to try to build a schedule that's strong enough where if we have success, you can schedule and try to get in that large. And so that's something, again, philosophically that we try to do. Uh, but yeah, scheduling is really hard. I mean, whether it's FCS, FBS, uh, it's really hard to either get folks to come to the Fargo Dome. And, and like I said, sometimes people want a home at home. Again, don't blame them at all. So uh, it's a challenge in terms of we're, we're having conversations with a lot of schools. Uh, I probably won't get into too much detail now just because those aren't aren't in contract form yet. But uh, it's a it's a process. Our deputy AD, Todd Phelps, works really closely. He reaches out to a lot of schools uh, and try to find those right matchups. So uh, it's a little bit of a puzzle. But but again, something that's really important to us. And uh, it's it's an ongoing process, that's for sure. And, you know, I, I know I talked to you before the episode, the two biggest fan bases on our show were North Dakota State and Jackson State. And there have been, I mean, if you could see the comment section sometime when those two schools come up, it is insane to watch. Has there been any talks? And if not, is that a school that North Dakota State is looking at with a huge stadium with 60K down there in Jackson that would be a potential home and home opponent for North Dakota State in the future? Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've had some conversations with them. And, and, you know, at this point, there was an interest from from their end and and again every school has different philosophies in terms of scheduling and sometimes do the dates match up and so right. as much as i know fan bases want things to happen it just doesn't yeah. always match up with when we're open when they're open and um you know but at this point we had we had reached out because it, you know again i think coach sanders is building a great program down there and um there's been a, a lot of hype and publicity and you know they had great success last year and um, and so, you know, we like to go out and schedule teams that are that are really competitive and play at a high level. And I think there's certainly one. And like I said, we, we we've reached out. But at this point, that's not that's not a direction they wanted to go in and, and certainly respect that. Um, like I said, everybody has their own philosophy. So. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we'll, we're going to keep on trying to not just Jackson State. We're going to keep on as we look across the country. You know, we have some teams, some non-conference games coming up against some CAA opponents. We want to schedule against yeah. some of the better teams in the country uh, because, again, that goes back to our philosophy of trying to make sure that if we don't win the conference that we have an opportunity to get in that large. Absolutely. And this is uh, this topic has been one that I've had to fight on my show a lot just because I try to look at it from an analyst perspective. But fans, when they see football success, they say, OK, well, the football team's so good, so the school has to go FBS. And the the quote that I've heard probably countless times, I'm sure you've heard it, too, is that North Dakota State is an FBS school masquerading as an FCS program. And that has been a narrative that has been all over the place. And I disagree with it. But for you as an AD looking at it business wise and in, in terms of the entire athletic department, mm -hmm. what are the most important factors for you for a potential North Dakota State move to the FBS level? Well, I think first, just to address the, you know, the masquerading piece, because I think that's kind of a little bit more of a negative connotation. And and, and yeah. I and I think this dates back to, I mean, we were a long time Division II uh, program and, you know, had the fortunate uh, opportunity to wait. We won eight national champions at the Division II level. And I'm a firm believer in regardless of what level you're at, our job is to try to compete and win. Every game we play, we want to win. And um, so for folks who don't like the level or the amount that we've won, I I always thought we're never going to apologize for winning games, you know, because yeah. that's, that's, that's why we hire coaches. That's why we try to recruit the best. That's what our fan, the level of expectation that our fans have is for us to compete at a high level and win games. And so, um, you know, as long as we're in FCS, we're going to try to compete for our conference championship first and foremost, um, the, the toughest league in the country, in my mind, a uh, ton of respect for the teams that are in our league and, and, and are really, really talented. And so, um, but we want to compete on a national level and that's, that's not going to change um, certainly as long as I'm here and, and well after that. So, um, you know, in terms of FBS, there's so much movement right now in, in college athletics and, um, you know, in movement and, and a lot of instability right now and what's the future going to be. And, 
So I think the, the thing that we've always said is we're going to continue to invest in our facilities and in our infrastructure and in our people uh, in our student athletes and, and resources that we provide for them um, going back to, to, to compete for championships at, at the FCS level and within the summit league that we, we compete in and the rest of our sports. Um, but as all these things materialize in, in the NCAA, there's going to be movement and change. And as an institution, um, both from the presidential level and the AD level and other areas, like it's our job to position NDSU for our best future. And that could very well be at the FCS level. And if that's the case, we're going to continue to try to compete nationally. Um, but if there's other opportunities that make more sense for our institution, for our state and our region, you know, you'd be silly not to look at those. And again, that doesn't mean that NDSU is going to be an FBS program tomorrow. It doesn't mean that we may ever be, but, but I think we'd be negligent as leadership if you don't look at opportunities that are out there. Um, and with all that being said, we're really fortunate. Like I said earlier, we're, we're in an unbelievable conference with, with real, I mean, you look just top to bottom, you look at the top 25 preseason, it's littered with Missouri Valley football conference schools. And again, there's a huge level of investment there. Uh, we have some really, really good coaches in our league who do a great job. And so we're in a great place. Um, and it's we're, we're challenged year after year after year in our league and, and on a national level. So who knows what the future may hold. But but again, I, our job is leadership to, to, to weigh all our options and decide what's best for the issue in the future. Uh, absolutely. And I know the big question has been uh, throughout your tenure as AD, have, have there been any conferences that have reached out to you guys and just talks never grew? Or has there just not been any talks yet about you guys making that jump throughout this realignment process? I, I think from the day I stepped on campus, you know, there's been there's been conversations and, you know, some of that's from the media, some of that's from our fan yeah. base, some of that it just locally here and then and then also across the country. Uh, and again, I think it goes back to from our standpoint is um, we're going to invest really heavily in our program to try to compete where we are, but also looking down the road in the future of, um, again, as just potential opportunities. And again, I don't say that as um, in an arrogance way. I don't say that in a we want to leave tomorrow day it, it, it way rather, but it, it's just more of, again, I think we have to do our due diligence and, and be smart and see what's out there. And, um, you know, who knows? I mean, if you would have asked the athletic department 30 years ago, are they going to be division one? They probably would have said no, but as yeah. things evolve and change and division two changed, it, it, it was the right decision at the time for a lot of reasons. Uh, and I think we're just in a very similar place of, we're having great success at, at FCS and um, and enjoying being a proud member of FCS football. It's an unbelievable level of competition, but you still have yeah. to look at what's, what's out on the horizon. And so, you know, those are conversations we'll continue to have. And that doesn't mean anything's going to happen, but again, we'd be, we'd be um, negligent if we weren't. <laughs> That, that's true. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people I always mention this is that people forget how young the program is at, at the FCS level anyways, especially when you start comparing to some of the, the you know, other programs in FCS. It's like North Dakota State's very, very young. And like you said, very, very impressive that you guys have had the success. And one of the things that comes from success, facilities and, and things like that, you guys just – Put 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 a uh, move on this opening in 2022 this fall. The Nodak Insurance Football Performance Complex, 50 million dollar project that is privately funded as well. Can you speak about how this came together and what this means for the football team at North Dakota State? Well, there's a couple of pieces. One, we've been really fortunate in the last six years. We've done about 110 million dollars in in facility improvements, new projects, construction, and and those are all privately funded. And it goes back to you talk fan base and how much they care, how passionate they are, what their expectations are. And you know, I've said from day one when I got here is that for us to continue to have success, you have to invest. And our fan base has heard it loud and clear. They've responded. Um, and so, yeah, we're fortunate. I'm actually looking out my window right now. Uh, at the NODAC Insurance Company Football Performance Complex, and it's going to be a game changer for us. And a lot of it's driven by a couple things. One is is the climate we live in. You know, we live in the upper Midwest where, uh, you know, for six months out of the year, you, you really don't have the opportunity to be outside. And so uh, we've had a bubble for the last eight years or so, which has served us really well. Uh, but we needed something more permanent. And so as I look outside at this complex, we have a uh, a, a full outdoor field that's lit now that transitions into our indoor facility. So we've been utilizing the field through 
uh, preseason camp. The indoor facility will open up in the second week of October, uh, but it's a full football field in there. Uh, but it also allows all of our other outdoor sports, baseball, softball, uh, golf, soccer, to be able to utilize that space with some netting systems. Uh, but then also we're, we're pouring the footings now for our West Operations building, which will be uh, a new weight room, a recruiting area, uh, sports medicine space, locker room space, and some meeting rooms that, again, now you're kind of one-stop shopping for our football program. Because right now they go to three different places depending on what kind of practice they want. Well, now everything's right here kind of in one complex. So it, it from a so from a training and development, from an efficiency standpoint, uh, but then also from a recruiting standpoint, to be able to, instead of showing recruits a two-dimensional rendering of what this is going to look like now, they can we can walk them through it. They can see it up close and personal. Um, they can see the impact it's going to have on their experience when they're here at NDSU. So so for a lot of reasons, we, we needed this facility, but it wouldn't be at all possible if it wasn't for our incredible fan base and, and donor base who just supports us at such a high level. Yeah, and just to give people, you know, um, an idea, one one foundation, the WEB Giving Foundation, donated fifteen million dollars to this project, man. So that that shows how much the the community is getting behind this program. And I know we had some North Dakota State players, some Montana Montana State players on the show, and they spoke about how in the spring season it was so hard to practice because there were times where you just can't get on the field because the, the field would be frozen and, and things like that. So I think the fact that you guys got this done is very impressive. And the final question, I know you're extremely busy and I just appreciate the 30 minutes you gave me is I've heard the player's perspective. I've heard the coach perspective. I want the administration, the administration percept, um, perspective. What have been the keys to creating this dynasty in football? I've mentioned you guys are only FCS for, for a handful of years before this. You guys come in and have immediate success, and now we're aiming for your 10th FCS championship, already leading in history for national championships at the FCS level. What have been the keys in your mind that have helped create this football dynasty? Well, I think there's a couple things. And one, it, it, it did start in 2000. It didn't start in 2011. You know, as I mentioned, we, we had won eight national championships at the Division II level. So you can really trace back some of the success or a lot of the success that we've had in football back to the 1960s. We won our first national championship in 1965. And a lot of the things at that time that were instilled in our program uh, and across our athletic program still ring true today and so a lot of it's being just staying true to who you are I think is really important but you know you still look at I think back in the division two days early on a lot of our our student athletes were from probably North Dakota Minnesota South Dakota you know kind of the three-state region and I think when you look at the core of our rosters today it's upper Midwest kids and you know you think about some of the um, characteristics that are representative of those communities in the four or five state region. You talk about hard work and adversity and character and integrity. All of those things, I think, are reasons why we have the success that we do. Um, you know, there's an incredibly high standard here. And um, either when you come in as a staff member, a coach, a student athlete, either you you live up to the standard or you're probably not going to make it here at NDSU. And so our coaches do an incredible amount of job of vetting players on the front end, recruits on the front end in terms of athletic ability is probably the last thing they look at. They look at their character. They look at their work ethic. Are you a good student? Because if you're not a good student, you're not going to be a good football player. You know, all of those, those positive habits that you have that they translate in every aspect of your life. Are you, are you making the right decisions socially, academically, and athletically? Um, and so they do a lot of that vetting. And then obviously, you know, can you can you compete at this level? Do you have what it takes? Those kinds of things and from a work ethic standpoint. So a lot of it dates back really far, but we've carried it forward. We bring in former players all the time to talk about what it means to be a bison. Uh, we talk about bison pride and, and what that means. And so um, and it's not just talk. These are things that we live every day. And one of the hardest things I think today in, in college athletics or the world of college athletics, the the hardest thing sometimes for students to do is to hold hold their their counterparts accountable, you know, to to hold your friends accountable when they're not living up to the standard. And that's not being a jerk. It's not calling it, but it's if you're not going to live up the standard, somebody has to call you out. And we've been fortunate that we've had unbelievable leadership uh, in our upperclassmen that that maintain that standard and hold their teammates accountable to what that means. And so I think that's where you know, that's translated into the success, the consistency level that we've played at. And, um, you know, really fortunate to, 
to have a program and, and, and people in the program that believe in what we're trying to do. Well, man, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show, shedding some light on the behind the scenes things going on with North Dakota State as you guys look to win the 10th FCS National Championship in like the past 12 years, which is I can't believe I always tell the players I can't believe I'm saying that doesn't even sound right. But before I let you go, anything you want to you want to plug to people, let people know where they can find North Dakota State football this year, any any messages you want to give to the people listening? Well, I would say one, just thanks for the thanks for being a fan of FCS, you know, and that goes to all of the the fan bases out there. It's it's great that, like you said, you have fan bases who engage with you. That means they care. They're passionate. They understand this is a really good level of football. Uh, you look across the NFL. There's a lot of FCS players that are running around at the NFL level and having great success. And so, I think sometimes people don't understand just the how good this level of football is and the, and the type of players and people that we're producing. And so, um, yeah, but absolutely, I hope you you follow the Bison this year. And um, you know, we have some great kids in our program. We have, you know, like I said, we have our first FBS game in six years, but. Um, you know, certainly follow us and, you know, we're going to, we're going to try our best to rep- represent the state of North Dakota and NDSU this year. Guys, make sure to follow North Dakota State football this year. As you know, we'll be covering the entire season right here on the Blue Bloods. But guys, for Matt, myself, and the Blue Bloods, we are out for right now.